Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Today, we have on a special guest, Jeffrey Blackwell, who is counsel for American Atheist. Jeffrey, welcome to the show. Hi, Jeffrey. How are you doing today? Doing great. Thank you. Interesting times uh, to be working. Uh, I think you would agree. Uh, Jeff, by way of introducing your organization, what is American Atheist and, and what do you do? What is your mission? Sure. Um, well, American Atheist is a uh, national nonprofit organization that started um, in the wake of Madeleine Murray O'Hare winning um, a, at the Supreme Court, um, her case getting a prayer out of schools um, back in the early 60s. And we have been doing this kind of work ever since, trying to maintain the separation between religion and government and uh, promoting um, promoting atheists, trying to remove the stigmas that are attached to the word atheism and to the atheist community generally. Um, we at, uh, have a legal office in D.C. where I work that handles our litigation efforts as well as um, lobbying and advocacy. Um, Promoting positive uh, laws and policies uh, in at the national level and in states all around the country, um, and also opposing bills that would um, chip away at the separation between religion and government. Yeah, and I think that's very important: the, the separation between church and state. And and this is where uh, you sort of came onto my radar. American atheists. I'll give our new listeners are set up. In August 2018, there was a photo on social media which showed a Scientology kiosk in the Los Angeles Police Department's Hollywood station. And did, did that come to your attention? Did someone send it to you? Yeah, a, um, a member of the Hollywood um, community. And when I say the Hollywood community, I don't mean an actor. I mean just someone in the Hollywood neighborhood in L.A. <laughs> um, uh reached out to us and said, hey, this, I was in the police station and there's this big um, kiosk. It's, and, and you say kiosk and you picture, you know, well, I don't know what someone might picture, but this was basically a, uh, I don't know, 48 inch LED screen pro with Scientology kind of, um, uh, I don't know, propaganda promotional materials being played. And it was flanked by various brochures and little, boxes of, of um, material pertaining to Scientology um, that had appeared in the in the uh, Hollywood division's uh, precinct. And so we um, wrote a letter to the uh, chief of police for the LAPD asking for some records and asking them to take it down because it's uh, promoting um, a particular religious point of view and under the establishment clause that's a bit of a no-no you know what what exactly what law does it violate when you say the establishment clause could you tell lay people who don't know the particulars what, sure what that means well um the first amendment to the u.s constitution um says that congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof um, and those two clauses sort of basically make up the uh, entirety of um, church-state separation in our country. The, it, it, it means that the government cannot um, promote a particular religious point of view, um, uh, coerce people into practicing a particular uh, religion, or disparage any particular religious perspective. Um, then the, the second clause, uh, prohibiting the free exercise thereof, um, precludes the government from um, basically infringing on people's ability to act in accordance with their um, religious or, or deeply held philosophical and moral convictions, is how I would put it. Now, there are caveats to that, just as uh, there are caveats to free speech where you can't shout fire in a crowded theater is sort of the prototypical example. Um, you know, uh, you can't claim that um, statutes uh, outlawing murder are uh, infringing on your right to 
free exercise of your religion that requires human sacrifice. That's just not going to fly. Um, so there are boundaries. Um, but where possible, the government is supposed to essentially um, stay out of religion and treat it uh, and not put religion on a pedestal, if that makes sense. Sure, it does. It's, it's sort of like... A Sure, it does. It, and just for our, our listeners, it's a big unit. It's got, you, you say it has a, like a 48 inch monitor, but beyond that, it stands probably seven feet tall. It's mm -hmm. probably at least six feet wide because it, it has the center display. And then it has two wings on either side that have literature and brochures. And inside of it is a computer that drives all the videos. So it's a touch screen and you can touch it and get all your questions answered about the Church of Scientology. Uh, the Church of Scientology has an, a, a front group called Drug Free World, which they distribute pamphlets on and it had plenty of pamphlets. Right. Now, now I'll, I'll give you my background on this and, and my paradigm from where I come from. Um, I was a sales engineer for 30 years in the corporate world. I worked on lasers. I'm a lighting specialist. I worked all kinds of lighting. And one of my clients was the Los Angeles Police Department. And I did sell to LA City, LA County, Los Angeles Police Department, Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. So I'm very familiar with Los Angeles bureaucracy. And, and what I know is in a police department, just like a fire station, you can't just bring any object into it. Why? Because a, a, police, a police station has a power budget. And this is very important if you, if for civil unrest and you were to lose power or you were just to lose power in an earthquake, you have to be able to have enough power on the generators. Mm -hmm. so, so by adding an outside device in the event that you had to go to the backup generators in a police department. This Scientology kiosk is the last thing you'd, you'd want running. You'd want the um, radios running, the computers running, but not a Scientology kiosk. The second thing I wondered was this seismically anchored to the wall in the event of an earthquake, because this thing is so big, it could kill someone if it went over. And then the third thing I know is that in order to do anything in a police station, you have to have what's called a work order. That is a police station must go to LAPD facilities and get a work order. And then LAPD facilities calculates the power budget, seismic and the other concerns before it allows this, you know, this kind of device to be put in. So this picture we see is a very narrow, narrow hallway, which would block right a passage in the event of a power outage. It, would, it could potentially block egress, and, you know, under emergency lighting and things. And now this is, this is where the story gets interesting, Jeffrey. LAPD Hollywood Station is commanded by Captain Corey Polka. And we've seen him in pictures at the Scientology Celebrity Center, accepting uh, cash donations from the Celebrity Center. Mm -hmm. we, we know that he's very close to the Church of Scientology. I happen to know that he did this without a work order. So when LAPD removes it did they give you the documents you asked for um no they uh, our request for documents went through uh lapd's normal process and and actually i'm not sure if it's still available because it's closed but um lapd has a a very good um uh public records request system so that you can go in and track and see how your your request is is being processed and um it went through all the, the normal processes, um, but they were not able to find any records that were responsive to what we were asking for, um, which uh, was basically um, records of, of the kiosk uh, being delivered, the police department uh, taking, uh, taking receipt of this kiosk, um, anything um, involving the installation of it, um, work orders and that sort of thing. Um, and, and they said that they, there were no, uh, records along those lines. Which to me, uh, it, it does indicate that Captain Polka did it on his own authority. And, but, but I don't think they would be withholding records. I mean, there would be no reason for them to withhold records. 
<laughs> well, no, I would I would think not. And and if you if you withhold existing records, um, it's actually a violation of the the statute itself and would be uh, on its own grounds for a legal action. Um, I am of the opinion that there aren't. Um, that that they are correct when they say that there aren't records responsive to to our request. Um, whether that means it was Captain Palka or uh, someone else at the at the um, Hollywood division, I I don't know. No, and no, and we won't. And uh, having having been in in corporate life, we have a saying that it's better to ask forgiveness than permission. <laughs> so yes. so my my feeling here is that uh, Captain Balka said, let's put it in and see if anyone squawks. And if someone squawks, we'll, we'll remove it, right? Mm. Because there's no fight over this. It just simply got removed. I think, uh, uh, yeah. Yes, correct. Um, once, we, once we sent our letter to um, the uh, LAPD chief of police, um, it got removed within about 48 hours. Yes, and I, as I look at the pictures, this is interesting because what Scientology engages in is what's called safe pointing. Have you heard that term, Jeffrey? Um, I've come across it, uh, but have not in, in some of the reading I did back when this was um, still a, a, a live case for us. Um, but I didn't dive into it too deeply. Um, but uh, so... Feel free to <laughs> feel sure. free to educate me on it because I, I would love the background. Yeah, and I'd like to, to educate our listeners, uh, especially those in, in your audience, American atheists. Safe pointing L. Ron Hubbard is an L. Ron Hubbard term, and L. Ron Hubbard created it. It means to literally safe point to protect the Church of Scientology in areas that really matter: opinion leaders, police departments, politicians. So what you do is you go in and find out what they need and want and you give it to them and basically you want Los Angeles Police Department and other police departments to think well Scientology is not a bad organization they're helping out so this is really this is where Scientology is so clever but also covert they have um, several front groups that are not religious they're nonprofit, but they are not 501c3 religions, correct? Mm. And Youth for Human Rights, United for Human Rights, Drug Free World, Drug Free Marshals. And okay. uh, so they have these groups. Now, th this is, this is to me, I want to ask you as an attorney, because this gets into a gray area. They're, they're secular groups, technically. So let's take Drug Free World. Drug Free World publishes a series of informational pamphlets that, you know, like on marijuana, ecstasy, opiates, and so on. And they're just informational pamphlets on what the drugs do and why they're dangerous. Okay, now gotcha. that in and of itself seems innocuous. The Drug Free World pamphlets don't trace to Scientology per se. So, Every police department in the United States is overworked and, <laughs> and, and under budget, right? Yes. And, and our, the men and women of our police departments do very good work, but they have so many boxes they have to check to comply with all kinds of mandates, you know, local, state, and federal, right? Yeah. And, and one of those boxes they have to check is drug education. And it's like, if you're a police chief, how am I going to work in drug education? Well, I can send officers to schools to do presentations. This is where Scientology ingeniously figured out, well, why don't we print all this free literature and just give it to police departments? Because that's what they want and need, right? Mm -hmm. And in exchange, all we want are photographs with police officers holding our literature next to our Scientology officials. And then we'll put those on our website. So the police department can get all this drug-free literature to distribute at schools and other places. And Scientology gets its pictures with police officers. And Scientology's logic is that, well, in the mind of the public, we are helping educate people about the danger of drugs, which nobody objects to that, right? Sure, in, in general principle. 
Well, no, who, who, who would support, you know, uh, taking drugs, taking illegal drugs? So, oh, I'm, I'm uh, sorry. Yeah. I, I, I would say I have no objection to people providing factually accurate information about, uh, about drugs and addiction to, uh, to people. Yeah, correct. But, so it's sort of like one of those Scientology cleverly says, well, if you object to us educating people about the danger of drugs, then you must like drugs. This is, this is where they get into their propaganda. So you can't really argue. It's sort of like saying, do you still beat your wife? Well, no, I, mm. you know what I mean? <laughs> right. So that, so you can't argue with, argue with them distributing these, these informational pamphlets on drugs. But what it does is it puts Scientology into police departments and it's actually members of the Church of Scientology distributing these pamphlets, right? Mm. And I'll give you an example. Um, Los Angeles Police Department, and, and this is a question for you as a lawyer. Los Angeles Police Department, Northeast Precinct, Captain Arturo Sandoval. Captain Sandoval is a very good guy. I was in the um, Northeast recently, and I saw drug-free world pamphlets in the, you know, the corner of the, uh, their brand new beautiful facility. Now, is it a violation of church state to have these secular drug-free pamphlet groups in a police station? So it would, um, it would depend on uh, the facts and circumstances surrounding it. Um, uh, the, speaking just, just broadly, um, any organization producing, you know, um, medically accurate information um, you know, with, uh, you know, in order to educate the public um, would be fine. I, the, I think regardless of the source, um, the question becomes um, whether they are being given, whether because of the source, they are being given um, uh, special access, special um, consideration as a result. Um, uh, in, in addition to a number of other potential um, potential issues. Um, but I, I think what's most salient in the case that we're talking about is, is um, you know, what is the organization providing materials getting in return? Well, in Scientology's case specifically, they're getting photos of themselves with uniformed members of the Los Angeles Police Department, which they then use on Scientology religious websites. They use it on Scientology church websites. Mm. So it goes from being a secular pamphlet, however it winds up on a church website, the, Im the impression it would give to the unwary is that the Los Angeles Police Department supports the Church of Scientology. Uh, quite possibly. And where it's where it is part of a um, uh, a broader kind of symbiotic relationship between the government agency and the religious organization, um, uh, there are a number of other potential concerns. Um, uh, I believe you've you've talked about um, uh, the reliance of the um, at least the Hollywood division of the LAPD um, relying on um, uh, the surveillance equipment installed in um, Scientology owned um, buildings in conducting their investigations. If I, am I remembering that correctly and, and accurately conveying? You, you are, uh, you are Jeffrey. And in fact, Scientology boasts about it. Scientology is a very much a culture of surveillance. They have cameras everywhere. So here where my wife Karen and I live in Los Feliz, the celebrity center is ringed by layers and layers of cameras, as is the, the complex or what you call big blue, the famous picture so many people see. Mm -hmm. And they've noted on their, Scientology has noted on its websites that its cameras have helped in solving crimes because the police will go and say, hey, can we get your footage? And, you know, they cooperate and say, hey, you know, and they might get a license plate and catch a criminal. So they're involved in, they're involved that way. Uh, and, right. and, and to be fair, right across the street from um, the big blue complex here in L.A. is Kaiser Permanente Hospital. They could also go to Kaiser and ask for films as well. So there is that involvement and there is 
Scientology offers that service to the police department, again, to safe point them. Mm -hmm. And then the concern, at least to my view, becomes, is that, um, you know, it, is that kind of part of a, a, an implied quid pro quo? Um, mm -hmm. if, if, uh, if the LAPD um, Hollywood division had not put up the Scientology kiosk would, um, you know, rather than rather than put it up and let's see if someone complains, just do the right thing from the start and say, no, we're not putting, you know, religiously backed material in uh, in the police department. Um, would they perhaps be concerned that when they uh, were trying to do an investigation down the road, uh, perhaps these uh, Scientology owned facilities would be less cooperative. Um, That's an interesting question. And just changing gears for a minute, uh, Jeffrey, are you in front of your computer? I am. Oh, if you could, if you could go to Google, the All Seeing Oracle. If, mm -hmm. you, if you go to Google Images, and I invite our listeners to do this as they're listening, type in Scientology Police Departments in Google Images. Click, and you will see. What the Church of Scientology, not the not the secular arm, drug-free world, but what the church is trying to accommodate is you get basically this is their program: pictures of smiling police officers holding our drug-free literature world. Mm -hmm. And what's very noticeable that stands out is there's a lot of Los Angeles Police Department images. And you do see uh, Captain Palka at Celebrity Center. It's it's uh, with a twenty thousand dollar check he's presenting from the Holly. Uh, it's to the Hollywood Police Department Youth Development Programs from Celebrity Center International, which is the religious component of the church. Mm. And you see them doing block parties, and you see them at other events. But that's their general concept: smiling police officers. So this is the PR component of it. One other, and, and this is something um, Leah Remini on her show, she and Mike Rinder just did two episodes on the Clearwater Police Department. And many people feel that the Clearwater Police Department is in the pocket of the Church of Scientology because they've had a 20 year long term association. Mm -hmm. And it seems like whenever protesters show up, you get, it's just excessive taxpayer dollars five or six police officers. In a recent episode, it showed Leah and Mike Rinder and uh, Mark Bunker sitting on a park bench on a Scientology owned park and you had six police officers. Well, that's a waste of taxpayer dollars. You, you don't need six officers, uniformed officers. The cost of that's amazing to go harass people about a 20 year old injunction. Right. Now, Captain uh, our chief Daniel Slaughter of the Clearwater Police Department felt so perturbed about this that he made a video and put it out in social media saying we have many constituencies we have to serve and only some tiny percentage of our calls are to Scientology. When, when, did, when do you cross into violating church and state versus just appearance of impropriety? Could you discuss those two things? Oh, well, that's, um, it's, very difficult to draw a clear line. Um, part of part of what makes my job so interesting is that um, all the all the various um, sort of uh, jurisprudential rules and um, precedent that are at play in the establishment clause uh, in any establishment clause analysis are um, very very fact specific. Mm. And um, people across what, conservative or or progressive, uh, what have you, um, view it as something of a, a, a dumpster fire of <laughs> just um, it's a mess. Uh, it, it is a mess, and so it it would be very difficult, if not impossible, for me to um, describe even in an even in an hour long. Um, uh, conversation um, exactly exactly where that line would fall. Um, I wish I could give you a clear answer. 
So um, it's like really a case by case basis. When you, when something comes across your desk, you have to look at this particular circumstances. Yes, there's a lot of factual research um, that that goes into um, what we do uh, because um, the whole uh, the entire analysis can turn on on uh, particular key facts, um, and you never want to go off. Uh, go off on this kind of thing half cocked because litigation is expensive <laughs> and uh, and we're a nonprofit organization so we rely on uh, uh, on our members donations and and I take it as uh, one of my highest responsibilities to use those resources efficiently so and that's a, and that's a point well taken and and in my mind um, it's clear in, with Scientology it's pretty clear where it crosses the line I'll give you an example let me run this by you as an attorney Mm -hmm. uh, David Miscavige is the leader of Scientology. His title is Chairman of the Board Religious Technology Center. And he, he, he basically effectively controls all the copyrights, trademark, intellectual property of the Church of Scientology. And he licenses them, licenses, licenses them to the Church of Scientology International, right? So he's, okay. he's the licensor of the church. But he also really runs for for all practical intents and purposes, in my opinion, the Church of Scientology is the alter ego of David Miscavige. Okay, to the Church of Scientology International, right? So he's, okay. he's the licensor of the church. But he also really runs, for for all practical intents and purposes, in my opinion, the Church of Scientology is the alter ego of David Miscavige. Okay, he calls, okay. All, the, he calls all the shots. He claims he doesn't have anything to do with running the church, but... He does. He even designs the kitchens at their bases and things. Um, mm. Okay, now his father, Ron Miscavige Sr., very good friend of my wife Karen and I, and of so many people, uh, Ron Miscavige Sr. and his wife Becky escaped from the church several years ago. They had to flee. Now, David Miscavige paid two private investigators, a father-son team, $10,000 a week to follow his father for two years, spy on him, mm. and and give David Miscavige updates on what Dad is doing because they were afraid Ron Senior was going to, you know, go to the media, which he did, eventually. Yeah. But but what happened is these two uh, PIs, where they were driving a big black SUV, and one day they were following Ron, and they were out. He was like at an ATM. So it almost looked like these two guys in the big black SUV in the small town where Ron and his wife live. It almost looked like these guys were going to rob the bank or something, right? Like they were casing. Mm. So the police roll up on these guys, pull them out at gunpoint, and they find in this vehicle an assault weapon, guns, ammo, scanners, fake IDs, license plates, and all kinds of stuff. They, they haul them in. So... Can a church pay for two PIs ten thousand dollars a week for two years to follow a former member? What is your just your opinion on that? Well, in general, a church cannot do anything that would be illegal for you or I to do. Um, so the question in this situation, if they, um, well, uh, let's break it down uh, piece by piece. Just. Sure. Just paying somebody to follow somebody else probably falls within the scope of um, uh, a local ordinance or state law uh, uh, pertaining to uh, harassment and stalking. Um, so uh, that um, might be – that could be illegal depending on the uh, – you know, exactly what the uh, state law or local ordinance says. I would imagine that a lot of the equipment that was found in their um, uh, found in their truck, it, it would be difficult for me to see how uh, having a lot of extra license plates and fake IDs and whatnot um, would not fall within the scope of uh, some sort of uh, legal prohibition. Um, again, not knowing all of the background facts, sure. um, as. A, a, as well, you know, are these guns, you know, properly registered, all of that kind of thing. Um, now, the question when it comes to the church, um, 
it would be, uh, you know, did they know that, uh, let's, let's assume that what the guys were doing was crossing the line, um, some sort of legal uh, line somewhere. Let's just say, let's just focus on the, the um, uh, stalking and harassment uh, statute, that their behavior ran afoul of, of that kind of law. Um, basically, then the question with regard to the church becomes, did the church know about it? Was that what the church was wanting them to do? Um, and if so, then, um, then they would, I think, also be culpable. But again, I, I mean, well, this is where I don't have all the facts and I don't know the local law in L.A. Okay, well, I'll, I'll add more context. Normally what the Church of Scientology does in order to be, because it's spending tax exempt dollars that are donated by its parishioners, correct? Mm -hmm. Normally the Church's Office of Special Affairs, their, their intelligence spy unit, will hire an attorney who may hire another, another attorney who in turn hires a private investigator, who may in turn hire another private investigator. So there's extensive use of cutouts to give the church deniability. Oh, well, we never knew this went on. Sure. Alternately, uh, my wife Karen and I have had private investigators show up here, as have other critics of the Church of Scientology and former members. In that mm -hmm. case, the church claims that it's doing what's called pre-litigation investigation. Sure. So it's, it seems to me, and I'm not a lawyer, that the church goes as close up to crossing the line as it can. And, you know, where it crossed the line is in the case of wrath. When, when you talk about churches and violations of public policy, some are clear cut, but what you're saying, some are not so clear cut. Uh, some are not so clear cut. And also um, uh, that situation could very well have been a clear cut situation. And I, I simply don't have all the facts yeah. in front of me to make that sort of determination. Um, so, well, could you give our listeners an example of a case yeah. you've worked on, which was a clear cut violation of public policy? Like what stands out to you as something where a, a church crossed a line? Where a church crossed a line. Yeah. Well, uh, right now we are involved in litigation against a church in Cleveland, Ohio, um, where they, the pastor of the church, um, uh, baptized through full immersion baptism a ten-year-old boy um, without uh, the parents' consent to doing so. Um, I would say that that's a, a pretty clear-cut. Uh, violation of uh, of a number of public policies and and general tort law. Um, you don't you don't get to put your hands on somebody against their permit against their will. You don't get to put your hands on a child um, against their parents' will. Um, a child cannot consent to entering into the kind of contractual relationship that a baptism generally um, creates uh, within a church you know, um, community. Um, there are a number of other aspects that I won't get into because they're not really germane to our conversation, but um, that's one of the more clear-cut ones that I've encountered in my uh, two and uh, going on two and a half years at, at American Atheists. Now, that's very interesting because one thing I've covered on my blog, the Scientology Money Project, and this is something I think, I think, uh, most people don't understand when a person joins a church and signs a membership contract or agreement, mm -hmm. they give their consent to be governed by the ecclesiastical laws and rules of that church. Absolutely. And when you give your consent over, that's a big deal. That puts you in certain peril or risk that you may or may not know about. Yeah. In fact, um, this again is not uh, not Scientology related, but there was a, a case in which uh, someone didn't realize a, f a, a, a Muslim man who converted to Christianity um, didn't realize that his the video of his baptism um, would be posted online 
which was the church's standard practice, and by agreeing to be a member of the church, he had consented to that. Um, and um, he, if I remember correctly, and forgive me, I, I haven't read this case in about six months or so, um, but he filed a lawsuit against the church for posting his video online because um, by converting away from Islam, he was an apostate. He could face um, certain risks to himself if he were to go back to the Middle East. Um, and he filed a lawsuit against the church. And in that instance, the court um, said that, you know, you, he consented to um, – the uh, the baptism and and to be a member of the church and the church's policies um, and the courts were not going to because of the free exercise clause um, the courts were not going to review um, the church's decision to post its baptism videos online um, so he ended up losing that case the difference in our case and potentially in some of the Scientology um, cases is was there true consent to join um, in in the litigation that we've got going on right now a 10 year old boy on the autism spectrum doesn't have the capacity and it's readily apparent that he does not have the capacity to enter into that kind of uh, to provide his consent to entering into that kind of relationship um, my understanding of how some of uh, some of the ways Scientology handles things is that potentially um, uh, some of the agreements entered into by individuals joining the church are also not um, fully consensual, let's say. Well, now this gets interesting because in Scientology Sea Org, which, by the way, doesn't legally exist. It, it has, and, and this is David Miscavige's attorney saying it has no address, no legal form in existence, no members. It's just a pledge. Hmm. Interesting. Now, what is that's what's uh, that was in the in the uh, Rathbun versus Miscavige. It was very interesting, but in terms of consent, Scientology Sea Org has children as young as ten joining, twelve joining. Can a minor give consent to join Scientology Sea Org to sign a billion year contract? So a minor would would not, but a the parent of the minor likely would. Um, a parent or guardian of the minor would be able to uh, consent on their behalf. And that's legal to say, yes, I'm going to allow my uh, 12 or 14 year old child to enter a religious order. Um, to my knowledge. Yeah. I mean, uh, obviously uh, any, any contract can have provisions that are themselves illegal. Like you can't enter into a contract to commit a criminal act. The contract is, is void. Correct. Uh, yeah. But in principle, um, I don't know of anything that would say that that was invalid. Okay, uh, that's good to know. Now I'm gonna run, I'm gonna run four contracts by you. I just want to get okay. your impression of each real quick. These are the four contracts. Now uh, let me say I'm not an expert in contract law by any means, um, and and <laughs> my contracts professor back in law school could attest to that. <laughs> okay, well I'm not. I, we're not. We're not in a court of law. This is just an impression. That's all. Sure. Because I want to show you that, you know, and, and to tell your listeners and in, in, uh, atheists um, how the church, their intake system fascinated me. Uh, because, you know, years ago I asked, I asked very simple questions. What is a Scientologist? How do you become a Scientologist? The popular misconception is that you walk into a church of Scientology, plop down $360,000 and you're good to go. They're going to audit you up through OT8. That's not correct. Scientology actually very much looks at the law and getting your consent. And, and, and I'll go through these and I'll show you what they're doing systematically. Okay, the first thing you have to do when you go into a Scientology org, you have to watch a film called Orientation. And okay. that film orients you to what Scientology is, basically. <clears throat> and then after you sign this, you sign a, or after you see the film, you sign a contract called Attestation of Religious Belief regarding the Scientology religious film called Orientation. That contract, you basically agree that Scientology is a religion. Now, why would they want you to first agree that Scientology is a religion legally and sign this thing? 
What's your Why opinion? Would they? Yeah. Um, I, from, from a legal perspective, I, from, from a legal perspective, I mean, the, so the government particularly is not in the business of saying this is, or, or should, let me say, should not be in the business of saying this is a religion and this isn't, or, or this isn't a religion. So by having the, um, the, uh, the would be member sign something consenting to it being a religion, um, then it, to a certain extent takes, um, that issue off the table. If it were to ever come to litigation between the member and the organization. So this is the first step in in pulling, uh, a would be Scientologist behind first amendment protections for the church. I think so. Yes. That's not, okay, then the second thing, the second contract you sign <clears throat> before you start auditing or any other service, before you start any service with the Church of Scientology, and again, this is a popular misconception that if you walk in and give them money off the street, you're going to do anything. No, you first sign that, that you agree that it's a religion. The second thing is called Religious Services Enrollment Application Agreement and General Release. In this... Okay. In this, you you give your consent, you give freely give your consent to be bound by the discipline, faith, eternal organization, ecclesiastical rules of the Church of Scientology. You agree not to sue the church, and you agree that anyone acting on your behalf cannot sue the church, and you also agree that you don't have the um, that if there's any dispute with the church, and that you're going to you're going to agree to binding arbitration with what's called the international justice chief. So basically, okay. this agreement, I won't sue. I'll agree to binding arbitration. Yeah, that's. Um, I, I mean, taking the religion bit of it out, um, uh, that's actually pretty standard language in any commercial contract you might sign right now. For if you. Um, you know, when you sign a contract for your cell phone service, um, you're agreeing, um, um, unless they have, unless the, the cell phone companies are, are um, uh, not up to date or have changed their policies, uh, you know, they'll include a provision saying that you agree to go into binding arbitration rather than litigation over any disputes involving the contract. Um, so that particular language is is pretty standard these days and the courts I should say have been um, uh, loath to um, overrule those kinds of provisions in contracts now that's interesting because the the federal court was not interested in uh, the Garcia case they weren't interested in overruling it and it uh, the Garcias had to submit to what in my opinion was just a sham arbitration mm-hmm Okay, now the, the, the more interesting one in terms of consent, it's in a contract agreement regarding confidential religious files. Now, in, in Scientology, when you get audited, you know, when you're there on the e-meter holding the cans, the church, the auditor keeps a record, a written record of everything you say. And so let's say that if you can you confess to various things, like because they're wanting you to do Confession is good for the soul, they tell you. But really, they're, let's say you confess to embezzlement, adultery, drug use, whatever, right? Mm-hmm. Now, the church has a written record of this, and virtually all auditing sessions are videotaped. Okay. So you're following me, right? Yes. Now, you're getting, you're getting some kind of uh, spiritual relief because you're finally admitting, yeah, I, you know, I stole money from my boss or... You know, I did this horrible thing. I cheated on my spouse, whatever it is, right? And those records that are both written and videoed, you agree in this contract that the church owns them forever and ever. You have no right to see them. You can't read them. You will never sue to get them back. And you'll never have your heirs, agents, assigns, or anyone else sue to get them back. And then the, this, listen to this language, uh, point seven. 
it says the abandonment, surrender, waiver, and relinquishment to which I'm referring is unconditional and irrevocable. So basically, Scientology gets you to irrevocably abandon your rights legally. Is that is that something that a, a religious believer can do? Hmm. So I have a, a number of uh, – there are a number of things potentially at play. First being um, uh, I'm wondering and I know – I'm wondering, and I know this is another area of law that I that I am in no way an expert in. Um, I just <laughs> I've signed uh, you know a number of of HIPAA forms in my life and have had to have clients sign uh, HIPAA um, authorization forms um, for the purposes of of my practice. And what is HIPAA? Just for our listeners who may not know, we have a lot outside the United States. The Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. So uh, HIPAA basically governs how and when healthcare providers, including um, mental health care providers, can um, release uh, medical records, uh, whether to other healthcare providers or to the patient or to third parties. Um, there's a lot more as well, but the part that's sticking with me here is uh, the, there could be a case to be made that um, that Scientology uh, is providing mental health care services, and so could potentially be bound uh, by the requirements of HIPAA. Um, but again, I'm no expert in this area, so there may be. Um, there may be a number of different ways in which they would not qualify. Um, but it seems to me, um, uh, acting from uh, admittedly very limited facts here, um, that just in the same way that a Catholic hospital could not refuse to comply with the HIPAA laws, um, uh, you know, a, a Scientology uh, center um, would similarly be bound to comply with a patient's request for their records. Now, that doesn't mean that the patient owns their records. Um, hmm. It just means that they have access to them. Well, that's interesting because in Scientology, you have no access to your records. You don't own them. But here, here's the upshot here for, for former members of the church. Um, in her in her lost her successful lawsuit against the church laura dykeman was able to show that over 100 people have access to these confidential prisoner records mm. so they're not really confidential the larger concern is that people who have left the church and spoken out the church of scientology in very bad faith has gone into these confidential folders and and published the sordid details of confessions online yeah and that, to me, that 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 shows the the lie. They want all the power. They want all your secrets. And if you were to leave, they can publish all your dirt online. Should you choose to speak out? So to mm -hmm. me, it produces a chilling effect on people who leave. Elron Harvard was interesting. He 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 said words to this effect: "We are not a police agency, but we are teaching the unholy a lesson." If you criticize us, we will come after you. Mm. And he said, basically, our deal is this. If you leave us alone, we'll leave you alone. And so this to me is, again, and I'm not a lawyer, this to me just seems to be illegal on its face to say, we're going to have all your secrets. We're telling you they're confidential, except if you leave, we're going to potentially use them as blackmail to silence you. And I think it's the dirtiest part of Scientology is this unholy fusion of religious yeah. First Amendment protection with the best of American secular contract law. Are you mm -hmm. seeing that come into play more and more in religion in America? Um, I don't uh, – I mean it is certainly a factor. I don't know that I can speak to whether it's a growing trend because I've not been at this for that for long enough to say for certain. 
I would not be surprised at all to learn that it is um, uh, a, a growing trend in, um, in with religious organizations. Um, but I want to jump back a bit to sure. the the contracts themselves because so in order to have a contract, you have to have uh, essentially four things. There has to be um, an offer uh, for something in exchange for something. Um, then there has to be acceptance of that offer. Um, there has to be what's called consideration, which is um, usually money. Um, I'm going to provide you this service, and in exchange, in consideration of me doing that, you are going to provide me with X dollars or something like that. Sure. Yeah. And then, and then finally, you have the performance of the contract. Um, now, it seems to me that in the first, the first document that you mentioned, where you're attesting that you agree that it's a religion. That wouldn't, strictly speaking, be a contract, mm. um, because at least with regard to that, you're not uh, there. There isn't any consideration. You're not being asked to do anything. They're not being asked to do anything. You're simply acknowledging that um, you view a particular statement as true. So that's a, that's why they call it an attest, attestation. You're right. attesting that you believe Scientology is a religion. Right. Now the second document it seems to me would be a contract because you are getting the benefits, I assume, of being a member of the church in exchange for whatever money you're putting in. Um, yeah, and in your, in your waiver of uh, you agree not to sue them or involve attorneys. And right. So, right. so in exchange for them auditing you to the level of clear you're, or wherever, you're agreeing to forego any legal actions and submit to binding arbitration. Right. Now, the third document, though, and, and this, there, contracts can be formed in a number of, uh, an almost infinite number of different ways. Um, but if the third, the third bit seems like an additional agreement, in addition to what you just signed with regard to binding arbitration and being a member of the church and blah, 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 you're also agreeing to give us um, ownership in perpetuity of um, you know, recordings that are made of your sessions. Correct. It's possible that that is part of the same uh, contract. It's also possible, if it's not done in the right way, that, that you're essentially making a separate agreement, but there's no consideration. You're giving them these rights to your... Um, you know, your participation in these therapy sessions, but you're not getting anything in addition um, in return. So oh. there's no consideration there unless it's, you know, an addendum to the earlier contract. I can't remember exactly it's, what the title of no, it was. It's a, it's a standalone contract called Agreement Regarding Confidential Religious Files. Interesting. And, yeah, and, and, and you bring a very fresh and interesting perspective to it. Now, it gets worse. There's a fourth and final agreement. Okay. Now, I should say, I would yeah. imagine that they have better contract. They have lawyers that are better at contracts than I am uh, and have that, uh, that it is a valid contract um, if I were to actually take a look at it, um, it's never, or at least on its face. You know, you know actually uh, – they have an infinite number of lawyers, seemingly, and this particular contract was tested in court. Laura Dykeman was able to get her uh, her confidential prisoner folders returned to her. So it has been overturned okay. in court. And thank you, Laura Dykeman, for persisting for all those years. God bless you. So she's gotten it back. Now, the fourth contract, we call it out here colloquially, the kidnap contract. Scientology calls it agreement and general release, or agreement and general assistance re regarding spiritual assistance. What this means is, is in Scientology, they do very intense, intrusive auditing processes. They, they can go like that, right? Like you could be asked for 
days and hours and weeks, what are your crimes, what are your crimes, what are your crimes? That's called a sex check. Mm. Now, some people, and this goes way back in Scientology, some people have suffered what's called a psychotic break. They just flip out. They go psychotic break. This happened to Scientologist Lisa McPherson, and, and Leah Remini just told her story on the show. Lisa McPherson went type three. She was at a uh, she had a relatively minor fender bender accident in Clearwater. Got out of the car, stripped naked, was running down the street. The police and paramedics came, and the church locked her up in what's called the introspection rundown. She was actually taken by the paramedics to the um, emergency room of the hospital, and they were afraid that they were going to put. Scientologist Lisa McPherson into a psychiatric 72-hour evaluation, which is called a, a Baker Act in Florida, I believe. It's called a 5150 mm. here in California. So a group of Scientologists showed up with this document that she signed, and it basically says, in the event I'm ever, I ever find myself in this situation, uh, I fully expect members of my religion to come and extricate me because I don't believe in psychiatry as a a doctrine of my religion. You're actually religiously disavowing any psychiatric help. You're disavowing psychiatry and you want to be locked up for an indeterminate amount of time until the Scientology case supervisor deems you're no longer crazy. Hmm. Okay. So this gets into mental health. Who is, in other words, can a church take you out of a psychiatric confinement because you don't believe in psychiatry and subject you to its own processes processes in a locked room on its property um in principle uh you can um enter into an agreement for um for that yes um but again that's in like broad principle um whether or not um i mean i would be very interested to hear whether or not that uh, that agreement has any sort of termination provision, um, or uh, does it purport to um, be you signing away or, or or agreeing to this forever? Um, because I don't think that that would be a valid contract. Um, well, what's interesting is going earlier. You've already agreed not to sue the church. You've agreed to be governed by their ecclesiastical rules and discipline. Mm -hmm. And this introspection rundown is part of their ecclesiastical rules and discipline. Now, what's interesting in this contract that's scary, it says, quote, I accept and assume all known and unknown risks of injury, loss or damage resulting from my decision to participate in the introspection rundown and specifically absolve all persons and entities from all liabilities of any kind without limitation associated with my participation or their participation in my introspection rundown, unquote. So a couple of things, Jeffrey. First hmm. of all, you're agreeing beforehand without any informed consent that you'll go into the introspection rundown if you have a psychotic break. Now, if you actually have a psychotic break, you're not in a position mentally to consent to anything. So can you consent to say, if I have a mental breakdown, I agree to be handled in this way? Um, yes, you could. Um, it, it strikes me as sort of analogous to, well, not sort of, as analogous to um, uh, a living will of sorts. Um, in, in, you know, you can have, um, in addition to a will of uh, what should happen to your things after you die, you can have a living will that says um, what uh, um, that lays out certain things about your medical treatment. Um, should you become incapacitated, you can have a do not resuscitate order, that kind of thing. Um, so that's, and that's an interesting approach. So you can agree that like if I do go crazy, I want to be treated this way and not that way. But now the other the other clause and, I read, and importantly, you can designate who makes the decisions while you're incapacitated. Hmm. So your church can make them for you, if you if you select, uh, you know, either some official from the organization or or the organization generally, 
Um, and and again, this is another matter that that is uh, that has some fairly significant differences from state to state in what can and can't go into these kinds of documents. Um, but nothing um, just in legal principle says that you could not uh, do that. Um, okay. But also yeah. those kinds of documents are revocable. Um, mm. So about a, f- a future amendable. date. Well, we'll get to that in a minute. But as far as like uh, absolving the church ahead of time of any risks or injuries up to including death, What's your opinion of that? Is saying, yeah, I might, I might die here, like Lisa McPherson, but I'll, I'll go ahead and absolve you of everything. <sighs> and the reason I ask, let me give us some more, let, let me give us some more context. In the earlier, sure. in an earlier contract, which I alluded to, you absolve the church of everything. So, example, and the reason I ask, let me give us some more, let, let me give us some more context. In the earlier, sure. in an earlier contract which I alluded to, you absolve the church of everything. So example, if you were walking up the steps of a Scientology church and broke your knee on ice, mm-hmm. that's legally, from Scientology's perspective, that's your, you have to pay the medical bill. If you slipped and fell, that's your responsibility. That's how far they go. So hmm. if, they're, if you're in the introspection rundown and you die, You've absolved the church. Your heirs have no recourse to lawsuit. Yeah, um, this brings me into an area of, of uh, what uh, tort law and oh, got some background noise there. Um, that brings up an area of tort law. Tort law is um, the area of law that governs uh, sort of the, the the duties that we owe to each other. Um, Cases involving uh, negligence or personal injury are are generally, uh, well, not generally, are tort law. Um, And one of the issues that can come into play in tort law is whether you have assumed the risk. Um, For instance, if you uh, take your child to um, a roller rink, which I presume still exists. They did when I was a child. (laughs) Um, Likewise, yeah. um, uh, it, if I remember correctly, when you, you know, when you go in and you, um, you know, buy your, um, ticket or what have you to the roller rink, you're, you're in part agreeing that, Hey, you're doing something that could cause physical injury. And, um, and you are, um, you know, within, within reason, the owner and operator of the, um, of the roller rink is absolved from responsibility if, you know, out of another, um, uh, another person's, uh, carelessness on the roller rink causes an injury, they are not liable for that. And that's Mm. called assumption of the risk. Um, so again, there, there is precedent for that kind of thing. The question for me is its scope. Um, if, as you say, it, you know, they, you could slip and fall on some ice that's um, out of their own carelessness, uh, they created a hazard that is not, you know, part of, let's say, the normal operation of a roller rink. Um, you, the fact that you agreed not to hold them liable for, you know, you, you run into somebody and break a leg versus you slip on ice that they didn't bother to salt out on their, uh, you know, entrance or what have you, um, would not be, uh, you, you wouldn't be assuming that risk. Um, oh, that's and I interesting. don't, yeah, and that's... I don't know that it would be, I don't know that it would be valid for them to, uh, to have you tr- or to try and get you to assume the risk of that kind of thing. Um, again, I simply don't know. I'd have to, I'd have to do some research into that. Sure. Well, you raise some good questions because you know, there's, you don't know what will drive you crazy. And it's sort of like you're agreeing. If you do go crazy, they're going to put you in this, lock you in a room 
not communicate with you, slide notes under the door. So what it comes down to, I did an article on, um, do you, you know the, the landmark case, Gwen versus Church of Christ of Collinsville? Marianne Gwen? Uh, um, the, it sounds familiar, so I, I'll confess something to you. Yeah. I am terrible at case names, unless they're ones that I've cited every day. Okay, well, uh, we'll So if you'll give me some of the facts, sure. I may have a uh, recollection of the case. Yeah, and we'll do this by, by way of wrapping up. Uh, this is really interesting. Marianne Gwen joined the Church of Christ in uh, 1974, Collinsville, Oklahoma. Okay. And the Church of Christ... And I grew up in the, the uh, Assemblies of God, so it's very strict church. Church mm. of Christ is even more strict. Yeah. And long story short, she she began a, a an affair, a sexual, you know, affair, romantic mm -hmm. relationship with a divorced man. So that's that's uh, adultery, right? And sure. the elders of the church went to her and said, you know, you're going to have to stop engaging in this affair. She said, fine. Okay. Understood. I'll stop this. But then they said, but there's more. You're going to have to go in front of the congregation and admit to fornication. Well, this is 1974 in Oklahoma. You mm. know, the, you know, buckle of the Bible belt. And if you a single mom going up and saying, I slept with this guy. That's the kiss of death socially. You might not even get a job. Slut shaming, we'd call it nowadays, right? Yeah. Uh, horrible to do to a woman. So she said, I'm not doing that. No, she resigned. Now, she went to an attorney and he was smart enough to write a letter of resignation. My client specifically withdraws her permission to be governed by your ecclesiastical rules and laws. She is no longer a member. Okay. Church of Christ said, now, wait a minute. According to our laws, you can never resign us. That's a Hotel California, right? You can check out any time you want, but you never leave. <laughs> sure. So, so therefore, <laughs> they went to four congregations and said she's guilty of fornication. This was after she resigned. And I'm kind of summarizing this simplifying it so the sure. court the, she sued for invasion of privacy and won okay so the point here is the court ruled that you have to to leave a church like scientology or any other any other group you have to make an affirmative act and that is you withdraw your consent why because consent belongs to the believer and not to the church mm -hmm. and i think that's a very important point for people who want to leave a high demand cult, a church, or just a religious group you don't like, you don't want to be a part of it anymore. How important do you think it is to put it in writing and say, I resign, I withdraw my consent to be governed? Oh, I think it's vitally important. Yeah. And um, it's it's actually, uh, and this is not a case that I, I'm familiar with. Um, looks like it's out of the Oklahoma Supreme Court. Um, yes, you are correct. Yeah. Um, and we actually have not, um, had too much arise out of Oklahoma, surprisingly, but, um, it's part of why I asked, uh, you know, whether there's a termination clause, um, because, um, you know, it, yes, it, any, this kind of relationship, it's, um, you know, it's a two-way street. I, I, I think, you know, if the church wanted to kick somebody out, they could. And if it, someone wants to leave the church, uh, they should be able to. Now, the contracts can say what the proper way to go about the the termination um, is, um, and, which and is what and to my knowledge about that point. Well, to my knowledge, and, and I, I ask any uh, listeners to correct me if I'm wrong, to my knowledge, the Church of Scientology doesn't have any form that says I hereby resign and you sign it, right? They don't have that. What normally happens is you, um, because Scientology ha erects enormous exit barriers, Jeffrey, enormous mm -hmm. exit barriers. They, they can put a lot of pressure on you from your family, from your client base of their Scientologists. So what's happened is that people who have, who have resigned the church, normally if they shut up and don't say anything, they can still be disconnected from their family members. They can still lose clients who are fellow Scientologists. 
They can be declared mm. suppressive persons if they speak out. They can be subjected to stalking, harassment, hate websites, and so on. So this is where the Church of Scientology is markedly different. You know, when I when I left the um, my church, Colonial Bible Church, nothing happened. You know, they said, we'll pray for you. And that was it, right? We're sorry you're leaving. Hope you see the error of your ways. And, right. we'll, pr and we'll pray for you. And and um, a very dignified, you know, to say, we'll pray for you. God bless you. Hope you come back. Which I didn't. But nevertheless, Scientology makes it hard all the way. Which is why I'm, I just want to put in the point at the end of our interview um, that any... One in the Church of Scientology is listening. Please write that letter to the Ethics Officer, Church of Scientology International, the International Association of Scientologists, so they are on notice that you are no longer a member. Mm -hmm. And then legally, that protects you. Uh, it would provide some protection, certainly, and it would. Um, uh, I would. I would suggest that people keep a copy, uh, you know, of of the letter, and if you should be. Uh, admitted to um, a hospital or anything like that, that you provide that to them so that if members of the Church of Scientology show up, um, the, the hospital will know that their um, claim is not uh, valid. Um, and I would suggest that people get put together within you know the structures provided under their state's laws um, uh, a living will that will supplant um, anything that the church might claim uh, with regard to its, I don't know, um, its say in their uh, health care. Those are, those are good points well taken. And uh, Jeffrey, I so much enjoyed talking to you. I'd like to, to have, you know, a part two where we can go into some more nuances. Absolutely. And I, I, and, and I, you know, I can brush up on my, uh, uh, HIPAA law and contract law. We have part two where we can go into some more nuances. Absolutely. Jeffrey, how can people read Atheist, American Atheist website? Where do they go to? Oh, um, absolutely. You can visit um, atheists, A T H E I S T S dot org, um, and uh, find all sorts of information. Um, if if you, in going about your day-to-day -day life, encounter something that you think is a violation of the separation between religion and government, you can let me know by going to atheists.org slash violation. Um, if you'd like to donate to support our my efforts and the efforts of everybody else at, at the organization, um, you can go to atheists.org slash donate. Um, and I'll mention that uh, in April, the weekend of Easter, April 19th through 21st, we're having our annual convention. Uh, this year it's in Cincinnati. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. They always are. Um, so I encourage people to, uh, to come and um, you know, hear some interesting speakers. Hopefully, I, I would love to see if uh, we could maybe get, um, uh, get you to come talk about Scientology at, the, at, at next year's convention. Um, Jeffrey, I think it would be very interesting to our attendees. I'd love to do it. And to it, I, I, I like the work your group is doing. And uh, just in full disclaimer, I'm not an atheist, but I very much right. support separation of church and state. Because I think it's so important in America. It, it's a fundamental thing. People of good faith may not agree on everything, but we can agree to work together on a principle like that. Separation Absolutely. of church and state. So, Jeffrey Blackwell, thank you so much for being with us and for surviving Scientology Radio. This is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Thank you so much for listening. As always, we'll be in very good touch.